Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to this event on the Aim for Forest program and its approach to country lab planning. This event will introduce a new project which is about to start, accelerating innovative monitoring for forests. But let's start with opening remarks. We have opening remarks from Julian Fox, who is the team leader for forest monitoring at the FAO. And we will also have opening remarks from Fiona Stringer, who is with the International Forest Unit uh, of the UK. She is with the Department of Energy Security in Net Zero. But we start out with Julian, please. Thank you, Till. Thank you, everybody, for joining us uh, late in the day. I'll provide some brief remarks because I, I actually have really enjoyed the GFOI so far. And I, you know, it's incredible to see the, the progress countries have made. You know, there's, there's 75 reference emission levels, 28 Red Plus technical annexes submitted to the UNFCCC. This re represents an incredible momentum, I would say. You know, many countries submit in detailed international reports for the first time ever. But you know, despite this, this uh, incredible progress, there, <clears throat> there are ex quite, quite a few concerns that I heard this morning as well on, um, on the sustainability of what we've built over the last 10 years. You know? what, to what degree are national forest monitoring systems institutionalized? And you know, how stable are the MA MRV parts of those national forest monitoring systems on which it depends? There are also concerns from the countries we heard over the last four days in different workshops on how their data and, and capabilities match to the emerging accounting standards. There are, there are some exciting opportunities in, uh, in climate finance, and we definitely don't want countries to be left behind. So, I mean, in some ways, uh, Forest Monitor and MRV, uh, driven by, by this collaboration over the last 10 years, is, is almost at a bit of a crossroads, I would say. I mean, we see access to performance-based uh, results. We see many submissions whilst at the same time, donor support for sort of readiness is declining. Um, I, I feel like there's a risk of forest countries um, not being able to consolidate and institutionalize their national forest monitoring systems and possibly not having um, high integrity data to participate in emerging accounting standards. Parallel to this, uh, GFOI is a, is a government forum. There's, there's been an increasing recognition in the recent COPs of the role of indigenous peoples and local communities in the climate and forest agenda. Uh, their role as forest stewards has been recognized. And under this program, we'd also like to include them. Um, we'd like to hear what they need and how we can help them strengthen their forest stewardship role even more. And we have a specific side event tomorrow on that topic in this very same room, and I invite you to join us. So with the UK, and uh, we, we started discussing this idea five years ago, but, uh, but I'd have to say a uh, huge thanks to Fiona and the team. In the last year, it has come to fruition, and we have a new UK-funded program called Aim for Forests, not Aim for Climate. I think we named ours before them, so. And uh, it really addresses that, that need that I just talked about, the need for operationally, operational and institutionally embedded national forest monitoring systems linked to domestic priorities and providing high integrity MRV supported by uh, an end-to-end -end country led planning process. So also including that IPLC element, which is quite exciting for us. Um, so today, I think uh, we're, we're, we'll hear from some of the early de deliverables. In fact, the program was launched on Earth Day, but because the GFOI plenary was now, we went into hyper-acceleration mode and started delivering under the program immediately. So we'll hear some of the early, early um, results. Um, we'll hear about uh, sample-based, oh, and actually during the plenary, we'll hear some of the outcomes of this new program around sample-based area estimation. We'll hear about the CEPOL online facilitated course from Rossio. And we'll also launch the IPLC work stream tomorrow. And we'll hear from Kenya, because in fact, uh, Aim for Forests builds on a smaller UK packed program called Impress, which was a pilot and is, is just coming to a nice conclusion. And now we are transitioning to the larger Aim for Forest. Just to say the program in implementation will work hand in hand with UN Red in its critical role in providing technical assistance to countries. It'll keep strengthening and building on FAO's digital public goods, which we have developed a lot with support from providers such as NICFI. 
and it'll also strengthen the GFOI collaboration. So this is, a, this is really exciting for us and the whole community. I think it's an opportunity to, to make sure that all our work is, is institutionalized and that, that no countries are left behind in, in terms of opportunities from new accounting standards. Um, please do engage, either as a support provider, we'd, we'd love to collaborate with you. As a country, we'd love to work with you. Uh, we count on your active participation. Thank you very much. Back to you, Till. We also have opening remarks from Fiona, please. Hi, hi everyone. It's great to be here today. Um, my name is Fiona Stringer and I'm in the Red Plus team in the Inter International Forest Unit of the UK Government. Um, this is a joint unit across the Department for Energy, Security and Net Zero and the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, which has been set up to support the delivery of UK Government's international forest policy programming um, and ambitions. So I'm really excited to be here today to share and present on our new UK International Climate Finance Supported Programme, the Aim for Forest Programme, which was launched in partnership with FAO a few weeks ago on Earth Day. Um, the development of a dedicated global support package towards forest countries monitoring and MRV capabilities has been quite a long time coming for the UK's international forest team. So we're really excited to have this now. Um, UK action to support tackling of deforestation and enhanced um, livelihoods and sustainable land use management has been quite prominent, including through support towards pioneering Red Plus initiatives such as the FCPF, Biocarbon Fund, ISFL, REM and LEAF. However, we do greatly acknowledge that there is a continued need for the presence um, and effective utilisation of high integrity forest data and MRV to ensure that these initiatives are really able to advance. Um, forest data is you know, really the backbone of successful forest and land use related activities and it provides the vital information needed to support the development of effective evidence-based policies and practices to protect, conserve and sustainably manage forests and to ensure that forest countries and their communities and indigenous people can be effectively rewarded for those activities that reduce emissions and contribute to global efforts to tackle climate change. So this new program is really looking at how we can support to build that long lasting capacity to advance effective forest monitoring and MRV um, and accelerate Red Plus and enable access to wider benefits. Um, it will really build on key lessons learned from existing initiatives which will um, speak through but um, both through international development partners um, and with our UK based Earth observation expertise. So the program will also deliver on our UK international climate and nature objectives, including the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forests and Land Use and the 12 billion um, Global Forest Finance Pledge. And it's also part of our international climate finance commitment to spend 11.6 billion to 2026, including by providing 3 billion to solutions that protect and restore nature. So I'll pass back to our excellent moderator, Till. Um, but yeah, super excited to be here and share this program with the GFY community. Thank you. This was Fiona Stringer with the UK government. Thank you, Fiona. <laughs> All right, I'll introduce the panel then, please. And if you would please uh, join me up here, that would be great. Um, all right, so my, name, my own name is Till Nave. I am a consultant with the FAO's National Forest Monitoring Team, and I'm the facilitator of this event. But we have a range of uh, great speakers. Um, we will start out hearing from Fiona again a second time. I've already introduced her. Uh, secondly, we will have uh, Faith Mutwiri speak to us. She will present some of the uh, Impress project and how that was instrumental for designing the new program, the Empire Forest program. Third, we will have Marika Sandke, who is a forestry officer with the FAO. She is also one of the world's leading experts on measurement, reporting, and verification. She will play an important role under the Empire Forest program, too. Fourth, we will have Ellie Reed. 
She's a consultant with the GFOI office, where, among other things, she works on uh, drawing up a process for country-led planning, which will be a centerpiece to the new program, and she'll speak about that. And finally, we have Rocio Condor. Rocio Condor, who is also a forestry officer at FAO, where she works, uh, where she provides technical leadership on issues that relate to the enhanced transparency framework. And she'll uh, relate an uh, early case of capacity development through the program, which shows you know, how we intend to develop impact here. We will, um, we will run through the presentations quite quickly because we have uh, five of them. So, um, yeah, I intend to do it in a way where we do one presentation after the other, and then we have time for discussion at the end. So if you have a super important burning clarification question, you can uh, ask in the meantime, in between. But the, uh, the remarks and the discussion points and all of those, keep those, uh, keep those for the end. The same goes for participants who connected online. There are about how many connected online? Hmm? 64. There are about 64 persons connected online, and there's about another 65 inside this room, so we get good participation. <laughs> Colleagues that you're connected online, please do ask your questions. We will also take questions from your end later. And then finally, if there were questions among the panelists, that would, of course, be especially exciting. But let's see how that goes. OK, excellent. We start out with a few slides from Fiona in addition to our opening remarks, who will present a bit on uh, the UK strategy, the UK strategy and why the UK decided to fund the Aim for Forest program. Um, cool, so yes, so I spoke to um, a lot of this a few moments ago, but just to recap, um, we all obviously know the importance of forest monitoring, forest data and MRV, or else we wouldn't be in this room, um, and we're aware and have heard already today of the broad international support that has been present in this space, the advancements of tech and data coverage and the magnitude of key lessons learned and successes from that action. However, we're very cognizant that the context is continually shifting and therefore the need for support still remains. Um, forest monitoring and MRV are difficult and standards and expectations evolve over time, particularly in the context of Red Plus advancements and integrity demands. Support may be piecemeal um, at times and can be uncoordinated, although notable coordination improvements have occurred due to GFOI. Um, success takes time, particularly in developing a fully operational forest monitoring MRV system. Um, and our prior understanding or expectations of the development of these systems were arguably over, over ambitious. So forest countries may also face growing pressures to resource focus on other areas. Um, so we really do see that there continues to be a financial and delivery gap um, and therefore the need remains to consider how forest monitoring and MRV is, can be holistically delivered for a country's individual requirements and also thinking through what the end goal achievements and purpose is to ensure future sustainability. So there is demand for support with this approach in mind. Um, and I think, you know, notably Red Plus programs like FCPF and global initiatives and projects under FAO, GFOI, Silver Carbon, NICFI and others have laid and continue to lay um, the really important foundations for countries um, and projects such as UK Pact FAO Impress project have also provided valuable learnings and directional approaches to considering this holistic support for monitoring MRV. Um, so this additional UK 24.5 mil of funding provides an opportunity to integrate and leverage the various lessons and successes under these different streams to support countries harmonise their approaches to MRV and forest monitoring. So why the UK um, and what is our strategic rationale for support in this area beyond the obvious importance? Um, the UK has a really strong track record in and commitment to driving international action to tackle deforestation and manage forests and land sustainably. 
Um, at COP26, the UK led the way in securing agreement from over 140 world leaders to work together to halt and reverse forest loss and land degradation by 2030 and the Glasgow Leaders Declaration. Um, the UK also has a broader mission to kind of work in partnership with countries around the world to advance these commitments. A component of that has been our ICF commitment, including three billion on solutions that protect and restore nature. The UK has also had a significant role in Red Plus partnerships and programming. Um, and is one of the leading development partners through our investments under the World Bank's FCPF and the Biocarbon Fund, KFW's Red Early Movers, and also the LEAF Initiative. So these programs have really paved the way in, in terms of setting out the parameters for high integrity performance-based payments, but we're really mindful of the continued support that is needed in order to operationalize country programs and unlock the much needed finance um, that countries deserve. So support needs for Red Plus readiness still remains high and this new funding through AIM is acknowledging that we don't want to leave any country behind and ensure that opportunities are enabled for all. Um, the UK also has um, a wealth of academic and industry expertise, a prominent space agency and earth observation community with much experience in supporting countries in project earth observation and satellite support. Um, so we're really keen to ensure that the brains of the UK are shared internationally through the delivery of this programme. Um, so I'll talk a bit about the program development and kind of where this came from. Um, so obviously a key component of this, the initial component, is um, in stakeholder engagement and scoping existing initiatives, um, building on lessons learned, asking ourselves what is out there, um, what are the key takeaways and therefore what the gap is. Um, so some of those barriers that we identified and, and we heard some of these discussed in the session that was just had, um, things like over-focusing on spe fulfilling specific gaps or progressing without a comprehensive vision for the future, um, and incentives that are more supply-led rather than demand-driven, um, and also there remains coordination, capacity, and capability gaps. So UK funding in this area is really looking at how we can adapt to these lessons learned, thinking about the whole system functionality, the sustainability, how to ensure approaches are country-driven, and that they build on existing initiatives and consider the wide variety of gaps that countries may face, um, including particularly those methodological and technical gaps that indigenous people and forest communities may face in participating in Red Plus. Um, so that's how we developed our objectives for the UK support in this area. Um, we want to build long-lasting capacity for Red Plus countries to advance, align and implement monitoring and MRV systems that are fit for purpose and provide end-to-end uh, -end system functionality. Um, so yeah, build, building capacity, um, integrating forest monitoring and MRV within wider national policy priorities and commitments, uh, really realising performance-based payments for countries and communities, um, and also enabling scalability and long-term financial sustainability, strengthening the reliability of forest cover data, um, and leveraging UK expertise as well. Um, so our second step was to develop um, a theory of change for this, so really thinking about what we want our impact and outcomes to be and how we can reach those. Um, so last October, we hosted a collaborative theory of change workshop, partnering with GFOI and the UK Space for Climate Initiative to convene international and UK-based experts. Um, so I'll just briefly present on some of the key takeaway points from this. Um, there's a real emphasis in the room on sustainability and how we can ensure future sustainability, and a big part of that was alignment with domestic priorities and commitments, um, and incorporating forest country national systems um, beyond simply just red plus and there's an emphasis on quality quantity and consistency of MRV um, and forest monitoring data um, and really an emphasis on how important country led demand driven approaches are um, to ensure relevance um, and so alongside this, um, so kind of following, but also alongside um, uh, the UK approach for decisions relating to international climate finance um, is through a rigorous business case development process. And as part of that, we do a thorough options appraisal. Um, so yeah, really thinking about um, what it is that we want to do with this funding. Um, so it kicks off with an internal um, workshop to consider a long list of options which get refined through a um, strength 
weakness and opportunities and threat analysis um, that is tested against our strategic objectives, um, which I've spoken through already, um, and critical success factors. Um, so things that are applied across all UK funding, um, like value for money, capacity, capability. Um, the outcomes of that identified a short list of options for the ultimate delivery vehicle, and we shared a request for information from potential multi-country, multilateral delivery partners who might be able to implement a program of this scale and intent. Um, and that was followed by an internal assessment panel. And this led to the development of Aim for Forests. Um, so we're really excited that this has been announced now, um, working with FAO as the main implementing partner, but also in close collaboration with GFOI and UN Red to deliver support to um, 20 forest countries. The program offers a really holistic, um, harmonized approach to consider both the tech technological and methodological gaps, um, as well as the capacity barriers that forest countries may face, and it offers tailored solutions and support that acknowledges the need to create sustained systems for change, um, institutionalizing activities and outcomes. Um, in addition to this, an element that we're really excited about is support towards IPLCs and how we can advance IPLC efforts to monitor forest areas um, and enable access to forest finance. So our event on the IPLC component is tomorrow, so please do join for that as well. Um, otherwise, I'll pass back to Till. Thanks. Thank you, Fiona. Now, what that presentation really shows is how much thought went into developing this program, not only on the side of FAO, but very much on the side of the government of the UK. Um, so, yes, thank you very much for that. In case there is a quick clarification question, you can ask it, um, but the discussion we keep for later. The discussion we keep for later. Um, okay. Yes, what we do next is we hear from, uh, from Faith who will speak to us about the IMPRESS project. The IMPRESS project, which was a bit of a pilot, really, for this program. You know, because uh, that is a program that was implemented over the last, what, one and a half years or so, where we learned a lot on what a good approach could be for engaging with countries. And we hear about that now. And maybe you can recognize some of the elements uh, in that IMPRESS project and link them to the elements that we see under AIM for Forest. But Faith, over to you, please. Thank you very much, uh, Till, for welcoming me again. Again, I say my name is Faith Mutueri, and also not forgetting to re recognize my Kenyan counterparts. Otherwise, they'll let me, they'll tell me not to go home with them. Now, IMPRESS, uh, I want to talk about implementing high integrity forest data collection. That is what we have done through the IMPRESS project. I'm going to talk about the five activities here, about our FRL, the gap assessment that we have done and the recommendations that were there, what have we done that's impress in Kenya, the results that we have attained, and the way forward, what do we need after this. Uh, talking about the Kenya's FRL, again, as I said, that uh, this was through uh, support from the Japan government, uh, through a project called CADEP, that is Capacity Development Projects for Sustainable Forest Management in the Republic of Kenya. Quite a long name, uh, but the project, that was it, supported by JICA, and uh, we had a reference period of 2002 to 2018. That is what we reported in our FRL in 2019. Uh, the scale was national, and the only gas reported was carbon dioxide. The other uh, gases we never reported due to lack of information or data. The activities that we focused on were the four activities. Um, the fifth activity, we did not report on the same. Now, for the calculation of the emission factors, uh, we did a pilot NFI because the government of Kenya does not have a national forest inventory and it had a total of 121 plots. Again, as I had said, it's uh, cutting across all the forest stratas in the country. The generation of activity data we developed through a process called SLIC. Uh, it was uh, a process that was funded by the Australian government development of quite very many maps from 1990 all the way to 2018. However, in the generation of the activity data, we did only from 2002 up to 2018. And the method for, develop, uh, for generating the change was the map subtraction method. I think it's good to say this method, what we did, because this is what you have done as an improvement through the IMPRESS project. Uh, UNFCCC technical assessment was done in 2020. 
And there were various recommendations that were done, especially the improvement of our uh, quality, uh, improvement of uh, our data, the activity data. And that's how the impress came in on board in Kenya to support this. Uh, this started in 2021, the project, and it's going to end in 2023. And this project has got five work streams, the ones that we have been working on. And one is to, uh, to have a high quality activity data for deforestation, forest degradation, and forest restoration. Uh, the second work stream is better information on wetlands. This is to separate the, our wetlands, that is the mangroves, from the coastal forest, because that is one of our stratification in forest among the other four which is the plantation forest, the dryland forest, and the mountain and western rainforest. The work stream three is the aggregation of emission trends for carbon finance opportunities. We need to have an opportunity to be able to access the carbon finance from the country. However, how do we meet the requirements? This is the work stream three to help us support that. And the work stream four is to leverage improved data on policy planning and implementation. We also need to use this information for policy decisions. And the uh, fifth work stream is the lessons learned. That's the South-South exchange and replication in other countries. And that is why we are here to share with you our information, what we have done. Some of you could be able to take this home and also try to implement this. Uh, through IMPRESS, we did an uh, intensive gap assessment so that, uh, uh, to see where do we have gaps. This is as a result of the recommendations from the assessment report, the technical assessment from UNDFCCC. And from uh, that gap assessment, IMPRESS was able to see where do we have gaps and where we need to have improvements. One of the areas to improve is to check on our reference period because we needed to access the climate finance. What do we need to do about this reference period? Some of them will require longer periods, other shorter periods like five years. However, this we did a reference period of 2013 to impress to 2017 and a crediting period of 20, 2018 to 2022. Uh, the system or the way in which we approached in uh, doing the sampling is a sampling approach uh, using a two kilometer grid as shown on the map on the right. And they came up with 150,000 uh, point, uh, 150, points approximately for the entire country. And a machine learning based time series uh, was used analysis to be able to have the potential change locations in each of these points. Where do we have, where is it a likelihood that we have a change in this, uh, these uh, points? Uh, an interpretation of the points was done through Collect Earth Online and a sample selected from 150,000 of 7,313 sample points was interpreted. And a method called Ensemble Sample Based Area Estimation Method was used to estimate the areas for these activities that we are talking about. Deforestation, degradation, etc. Now, the sample uh, based area estimation method works as in the flow diagram shown. So we have a sample design, part of it, where the systematic grid is generated, the, the two kilometer grid, and a response design, uh, where we have the sampling to have a sample uh, area from uh, all the points that we have. So that you see where are those areas of change. And then there's the visual interpretation, the classification, and the stratification in different stratas. And finally, we have an analysis where we get the hybrid area estimation. Now, this going down to Kenya, what we did in Kenya in terms of that method that we have described in the previous slide. We had a systematic sample, as I said, of two kilometer grid and uh, which came to, we are saying approximately 150,000, but specifically is 149, 460 samples. And these samples were subjected to a same time series uh, using different algorithms, BFAST, QSAM, ETC, and generated a map, which is shown there, a map of probability of change, meaning that where do we have the highest or the lowest probability of change? So the blue part has got the highest, uh, the lowest probability of change, while the red, or the pink, depending whether you're male or female, some have color problem. So red, pink, that color is as the lowest probability of change. And then a sample was selected uh, of 7,313 and then categorized into three uh, classes or three stratas using the Neyman method. Now, a visual interpretation was done for the, those samples and it's iterative. So we do the interpretation go back again, check from the sampling circle as a, a area, the probability of changes, 
and then go back. Uh, during the previous pre presentation, I think there's a question that was asked which I need to address maybe here. What did we do with these two kilometer grid points? Are we, is it an inventory or what was it? But it's an interpretation from 2002, all the years you seeing the same point and interpreting what class you see. And that's why I think it is a probability of change. Is it a deforestation from forest to non-forest or the other way around, is it a restoration? Now, the visual interpretation was done uh, using different uh, institutions, not only the Kenya Forest Service. So we had the Kenya Forest Service, the Directorate of Resource Service and Remote Sensing, also represented here, and Regional Center for Mapping of Resources for Development. And the team on the right there, that was the entire team of eight female and five male that was represented, and the facilitators, or those that support and the capacity building and interpretation. So we have Teo and Wesley, also in the room, who are also among the group. We have already given them, they should be Kenyans by now. Now, the, this interpretation was used of a collector online, and uh, we had the two data collection activities. We did two rounds. That is, the first round was we did the 4,603 sample points uh, between the period given, and also did a second round of interpretation uh, of 2027 10 samples between November and December. Now, out of uh, the team there, we also narrowed down a team for the QAQC. Uh, for the QAQC, quality assurance of uh, to five people that did a QAQC team uh, to check the work that we have already done. Results. Uh, we, again, as I said, uh, we did the 2013 to 2021. However, in uh, generating the reference period and the crediting period, we only picked the area in blue, that is in 2016 to 2020, and the crediting period of 2021. Uh, having an average of the five-year period uh, uh, got a value as the table shown on the right and also uh, with a difference and got a difference so which means that we have uh, reduced or uh, with 1,152,000 uh, that figure carbon dioxide per year tons of carbon dioxide per year which is a, a percent difference of around 26 percent meaning then then we have some carbon that we can talk about uh, for the uh, for the carbon finance. And what's the way forward? This is my last slide, Till. And what we need to do that, we have done a lot of work under the impress. However, also we have uh, a lot of things on the way forward that we would want to talk. One of them is to, to further refine the estimate of emission uh, reduction that is focused on the mangrove, I said again as a separation. Also improve uh, the estimates associated with the restoration activities and update the reference and the crediting period as required or as needed. Then uh, we need also the ATRIS registration document. Uh, this is on the process. Also to improve our N uh, national forest alert system to be operationalized through, uh, throughout the country. And also we are looking at the outcomes of IMPRESS exchange knowledge that happened last week, which is uh, these are some of the things that came up about the degradation definition. Most of the countries had, others did not have a de definition. So how do we have that one definition as one of the things? Then also the climate finance programs. We need to identify similarities in programs uh, among the standards or to enable uh, submitting requirements effectively. How do we go about this as different countries that was represented? The other thing that came out was the sample-based estimation estimates. It, it seems that this method has become uh, rather a standard rather than an exception. So therefore, it's whether we are transiting or what we do about the transition between this method. And the last one is the benefit sharing schemes. Some of the countries have, some do not have, but it's a requirement. How does every country meet this requirement? Thank you. Thank you, Faith. This was Faith with Kenya Forest Service. Now, these two presentations that we've listened to, they, they describe the context for the new program, no? because the Kenya experience was instrumental for us in learning what kind of approach could be useful. And then uh, Fiona spoke about, of course, about the design process for this from the perspective of the, of the government of the UK. What we hear next is Marike. We will hear from Marike, who will speak to us about what the Aim for Forest program actually consists of. So Marike will show us a few slides on the activities, the outputs, and the expected outcomes of that program. Marika, over to you, please. Thank 
Thank you very much, and hello, everybody. Um, so yes, I am going to, I have the honor to, to present in more detail the, uh, this new exciting program, Accelerating Innovative Monitoring for Forest. All right, so I'm going to try to speak in less than 10 minutes, and here's the outline of the presentation, but let me go straight into it. So we've made a lot of progress in MRV, and tomorrow morning, uh, you will see this slide again, but not the other slide, so you know it's not gonna be too much of a repetition. But yeah, tomorrow morning, we'll have a session where we'll discuss all this progress that has been made by countries. So since 2014, um, when uh, REP Plus resulting uh, kicked off to the UNFCCC, we now have 60 countries that reported reference levels to the UNFCCC, and we have 21 countries that have reported results, which together add up to 30.7 billion tons of CO2 equivalent. So that's quite significant. But of those 13.7 billion, uh, not that much has yet received uh, payments. So a lot really still remains to be done. Um, there is this need to move towards high integrity, what, what these emerging standards refer to as high integrity data. So why? Well, first of all, they need more transparency, reliability, you need to calculate confidence intervals, but there's also, um, and here you see a little uh, um, diagram of you know, uh, uh, older approaches, which we, we refer to as pixel counts, or you know, just using statistics from maps and sample-based estimates. It's not just about reporting the confidence interval, but especially about removing any bias in the data. So here, these two examples, you can see that actually the magnitude can be quite significantly different. And in the lower graph, you can see that also the trend can really be different when you improve the data. And of course, this is really relevant for understanding if emissions really have been reduced. So it's challenging, though, for countries to move, uh, you know, constantly further and to um, improve their their data. So Aim for Forest really seeks to um, assist countries in meeting this this challenge um, and you know getting this this high integrity data. So the program is targeting around 20 countries. Um, and seeks to institutionalize the national forest monitoring system. So it really, it should not be, it's, it never is a one time off exercise, right? It's a constant, um, it has to be a sustainable system with constant monitoring um, that is happening. And countries need to inform you know, their domestic policy making uh, and decision making, but at the same time uh, reach the high integrity MRV um, requirements in these emerging carbon standards uh, to actually give them access to payments. You know, at the same time, you know, we need to consider the context of this all, which is really strengthening the AFOLU contribution in national determined contributions. So that is what the project um, seeks to, uh, to achieve, and the implementation will, will be through the UN RED program and specifically through Outpoint 1.4, which is all about high integrity MRV. So the outputs, there's uh, six outputs that this um, program is seeking to, to achieve. The first output is really about tools and platforms. Um, maybe if you heard it mentioned before, but of those 60 reference levels, more than 90% have used open source uh, tools or platforms produced by FAO. Now that's great, but that also means that you know, we have a responsibility to make, it, make them better, make them user friendly, um, make them in such a way that really helps countries to achieve the um, requirements in the emerging standards. You know, we also really want to have uh, learning programs and learning platforms uh, to explain um, all these, these different requirements, to explain how to use these tools. And here, Rocio is now going to speak to us about the, um, uh, the CEPAL online course in a bit. Then the third output is about uh, including indigenous communities in, um, in forest monitoring and seeking how forest monitoring can empower them and can make sure that you know, they also benefit from um, carbon uh, payments. 
Finally, we really want to have an end-to-end country-led planning process, and Ali will tell us more about this in a minute. Um, and output five and six are about technical and institutional gaps and how to fill these uh, within countries. So here's a little diagram to show that, you know, these different outputs, they're all related somehow to one another. You know, they're not standalone outputs. You know, the, the novel methodologies, for example, you may think about new sampling approaches, as Faith mentioned, that, you know, are under development under the IMPRESS progress, pro program. And um, which also in um, a side event on Thursday, uh, there will be more discussion about this approach. So these novel approaches, they may require also updates in tools so that countries can easily apply them in their country. So then at the center of this all is the country-led planning process and through that we might identify uh, technical and functional gaps to, to fill. And really the um, indigenous peoples, we really hope to um, have them you know, integrated all over. Um, and we, we, yeah, we hope to find ways of, of recognizing their important stewardship. So here's a slide which is a little spoiler for um, Ellie's presentation, so I'm not going to uh, talk to this. I'm just going to say stay tuned, more will follow, and Ellie will present this slide in a bit. Now, how to progress to, um, towards high-integrity MRV? So we see this, as, as already mentioned before, we see this as a, a process where all these uh, elements are, are related to each other. Um, so we try to uh, address methodological challenges. Also, you may have heard last week there was this degradation workshop where countries were given the opportunity to uh, discuss how they are assessing emissions from degradation and what challenges they are facing. And this is something that this project also seems, that this program also seems to, seeks to address. Then um, we need to have advanced, you know, the tools and data sets that, that, ca that can be used by countries and again the learning material that we'll see a little bit about in, uh, in a bit from Rocio. Um, we also really want to strengthen uh, the community or, or um, um, set up a community or strengthen the community of practice for indigenous peoples on forest monitoring um, and MRV. Here's just a slide to show, you know, how important it is to also um, for the uh, National Forest Monitoring System to be sustainable. So we really need to have data that suits multiple contexts. Of course, the data, you know, we want to the data to meet requirements for standards, you know, in, ca in case countries want to have access to finance. But we also need to really see beyond that and see how the country themselves uh, can use this data, how, uh, you know, decision making making can be improved with the better data. So eventually, you know, this data all needs to be accessible, relevant, transparent and sustainable for it to actually have an impact. So that uh, brings me to the last slide. It's basically a summary of what, uh, what we've managed before. So let me not read this out. Let me just allow you to, to go through the summary and I'll hand it back to Till. Thank you so much. This was Marike with the FAO team. Thank you. Now that's a bit of a sweeping overview. This is a big program and it, has, uh, it will target as many as 20 countries. It has a five-year duration. There's several million dollars of a budget. She was able to cram this into 10 minutes. Uh, chapeau. <laughs> uh, Marike, you, you have not shown this. Um, All right, this is a flyer about the InfoForest program. Do we have copies available in the room? They're down there, who after uh, listening to us for 90 minutes about the new program is still curious, can pick one of those. Can pick one of those, it provides uh, more details on everything that has been presented, especially on Marika's presentation. It's also nicely done, you should really have a look. Okay, so, um, yes. Look, that, that was the overview of the, of, of the program, what it consists of in terms of outputs, activities. One of the key uh, outputs is concerned with uh, country-led planning, and that is what we are going to hear about next. The country-led planning is really the engine, the engine of the program in order to identify priorities at the country level, and Ellie Reid will speak to us about this.
Thanks for in the introduction, Till. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. You've heard a lot about the Aim for Forest, and we're kind of tuning it down, and Mariki did a really nice um, overview. Um, it's a lot of work, so this Fiona, and I'm gonna present a much, much, um, from a different angle, let's say, let's say this. So before I go any further, um, good afternoon to all of you. My name is Ellie Peneva Reed. Um, I am the um, GeoFOY um, country led planning or CLP and also family of resources specialist. So I'm very, very pleased to see all of you here. I have worked with many of you over the years and I have seen very few of you in person and this is amazing. I'm very happy that we're back to this. It, is, it does make a difference. And um, before I go any further, I would like to say that the work we've done, uh, we've been working for the past few months. For those of you who were in DC in January know we've worked on a concept note, concept note that is shaping up pretty well, but uh, it's a work of my colleagues at geo 4 um, Tom, of course, Peter, Gabby, and our colleague at FL Till. So thanks to all of you for really working hard on this, and this presentation is really summary of that concept note. Uh, Till asked for 10 minutes, so I'm gonna try to put it all in, and I usually speak very fast, but for your own sake and to mask the Bulgarian accent, I will try to go a bit slower, so bear with me on that. Uh, so what I will present today will be the context of what the CLP looks like or what we have envisioned so far and how we, what we want to have um, tell you about it. Then I will go and talk about the, um, the CLP work in light of the country's uh, national forest monitoring system and their national objectives, uh, as well as provide an overview of the COP process and give you really a quick glimpse of the key features uh, uh, and what we have identified, and we'll then explain the COP process under the UK-funded UK project um, Aim for Forest. So I imagine that everybody in this room is quite aware of the context behind the National Forest Monitoring System or developing one, but again, it's a comprehensive process, not a simple one, and uh, I will read it because it's, it's very well put sentence here that we all understand, but once in a while, I guess we have to remind ourselves that if we don't see those systems really uh, in a point of being sustainable within countries is made because it's not that easy to achieve and we're still working towards that goal. So the National Forest Monitoring is a comprehensive process that includes the assessment, evaluation, interpretation and reporting of data and the derivation of forest resources information usually from repeated inventories that allows for the monitoring of change and trends over time. Another important point I would like to make is that countries, which are not always at the same stages of their national forest monitoring implementation, are facing multiple challenges, multiple complexities in establishing these enabling environments to sustainable national forest monitoring systems, right? Such as, and we all know them, but yet again, clearly defined system governance and administrative procedures. Enough people really in those teams to sustain such system. And then the appropriate equipment. Um, also, changing methodologies. We all know part of us are those who create those methodologies and they're ever changing and improving. And then adequate annual budgeting um, and other non technical resources being identified. And the third point I'd like to make is that clear national objectives are required for the international community to really be able to provide targeted support and generate efficiency and also help the countries in meeting their ambitions and raising them further. And another overview slide before I go to the slide that Marika already introduced and I'll walk you through that one is really the overview of the country-led planning process and um, the time I have really allows me to go through four points which we carefully picked to be the ones that we would like to, to talk to you today. Um, that's not all about, that all there is to it, right? But in general, the COP was um, initiated by GeoFOI to build on GeoFOI's experience of supporting countries over the years to develop more systematic approaches to assess their um, technical and functional uh, needs. 
The second point I would like to make is that the potential for the COP modality was recognized, really, for the Aim for Forest program, and the COP is included, is one of the six, as Mariki presented, major outputs, output four, of the program to be designed and then delivered by GEO4Y and GEO4Y partners. The third point is under the COP process, the, country, the countries will initiate, will lead, will coordinate, facilitate, and also set the pace. How fast or how slow this process will move will depend on the country. And different countries apparently, and will ex expect it, will move at different uh, pace. They'll undertake consultation and analysis to design the functionality and the performance of the National Forest Monitoring System with elements of the MRB. And last point, but not least important, is the fact that the COP is envisioned and represents really a continuous improvement through the a circular process uh, with uh, the idea that we will, do, we will have this long-term outlook and planning for what we've heard over and over say, but we really need to emphasize this as an exit strategy. And with that, um, I go to the, um, the circular process. It's relatively simply organized here. We try our best. We went through a few iterations, and thanks to Till for that, of saying, no, no, not good enough. Let's, let's do a little better. And so this, is, this might not be the last one, but this is where we are at this point. So the COP is envisioned to work in a circular process with countries really interested in strengthening their functional um, and technical capacities, and also interested in embedding the National Force Monitoring System in the associated MRV procedures within their national institutions. So the COP process will include assessing the necessary enabling um, conditions for sustaining the country's system, such as, and there are others as well, net national budgetary allocation, human resources allocation, legal requirements, institutional arrangements, and also administrative procedure for government programs. The COP will also cover functional capacity in order to support the technical capacity, such as to establish really a functioning and sustainable national forest monitoring system. And the initial uh, and you'll see this on the following slide, the initial cross-sectoral national forest monitoring system context assessment will inform capacity development in understanding, really seeing where is the window of opportunities and what could be done. How can we be helpful? Another um, table in the form of, of a flow chart really here that was much more simplified for the purpose of, of my talk today these are really the key features that we have envisioned to be part of the COP process. Starting from left to right, the COP workflow, which will include cross-sectoral national forest monitoring system context, context assessment. Uh, very briefly here, because I will run out of time, is that the cross-sectoral national forest monitoring um, system context assessment would really assess and map the national system planning, and administration funding governors, right? It's, 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 semi, it's, it's pretty clear. We're not inventing the wheel here. We're just putting it in a more organized fashion. Uh, the functional and technical gap assessment, also pretty clear as a concept to here. We will have identified needs to create or to improve the national system governance and to address technical requirements for carbon standards. And the third element of the COP workflow is the improvement plan. So we'll compile an overview of the steps that, uh, that address really thoroughly this capacity development and will be the basis for work planning. Um, the second key feature that you see here is the access to expertise. So, and you see two um, boxes underneath the expertise on governance, so, so to speak, the function, functional capacities and also the technical capacity and technical experts that countries will have access to in order to support their force monitoring and MRV. The third key features are the COP workshops, and um, this is actually through a few iterations. We, this is inception meetings at the beginning. Um, the, during the exception uh, meetings, and there will be um, institutional or functional uh, experts, as well as technical experts, to discuss with a team, a multidisciplinary team from the countries, um, what the COP process or the workflow, the timeline or deliverables will be or should be. 
And uh, then you see regional workshops, which are envisioned to provide the opportunity for countries to um, check on progress, really go and exchange lessons for the other for participating countries, and also go and foster the South-South collaboration that we've been talking throughout um, the, uh, for, for a while now. And the fourth element, key feature here, is the capacity development materials. We all know that over the years, a lot of materials have been developed, and there's the, the it's something no, none of us want to do is usually the idea is to not start from ground zero, but to step on shoulders of greatness. So we will use and we will take advantage of the GFOIS community, this collective experience, as you see here, uh, resources are listed, um, and uh, what has been gained, like family of resources, which by the way, um, all its members will be, we'll have a, a session to launch it, so I invite all of you to come. You have also the country needs assessment that we will also um, have learned quite a bit from it. Um, many of the um, FAO assessment tools and also the uh, lessons learned through um, collaboration with the World Bank and the FCPF fund will be all engaged into this capacity development materials. Of course, to that we will add over time. And with that <laughs> comes the still in a very simplified fashion idea of what the, the, the time looks like, the timeline of this, of this project. And, and we are, as I said, still working on this. So, but to give you an idea, just to walk you through the diagram here. So uh, Fiona mentioned to you, it was mentioned a few times already, and for Forest was launched uh, in April this year. Uh, we're planning to start uh, with already implementing um, some of the elements, the key features that I mentioned to you, such as the inception meetings, as well as doing this uh, country context assessment. And the idea of, this is very ambitious plan, I have to say this, is to, to have this done by the end of this year. The following year, we organize the workshops that I mentioned um, in my talk, which will, of course, lead through the gap assessment, both technical and functional gap assessment, and create this improvement plan with the long-term outlook. Throughout that, this will be implemented in, through improvements, including support from um, FAO and uh, mainly done by the GFOI team. As you see, again, reinforces the circular process of COP. We go to the next year, you check on improvement, you see what has been done, and you do it again. And this is the five-year timeline that it's set at this point. And if you have many questions about this, I wouldn't be surprised because it's a lot to to swallow it once, but I thought it's a good diagram to um, to give you an idea of how, um, in a way, this all will work together under the uh, Aim for Forest um, program. And before I finish, this is my last slide. Um, it's in, in a way challenging our own expertise and where we are so far, but if we don't, we'll never move forward, so to speak. So the idea here is, and I would expect to get questions, especially from the countries, is like, let's say we have countries that are participating in the, in the GFOI COP process, and here we have three different categories of countries, like some countries that will receive support under the Aim for Forest program, those who will receive support from the GFOI, GFOI partners, and then what if we have countries who still need to mobilize support? What do we do? How do we address this? And at this point, um, that is still an important element, and that is something that we need to figure out. So uh, let me finish with just saying that um, you can see that COP is still a process in progress, so please stay tuned, uh, but we're very excited and hoping that you will all uh, engage with us when we start implementing this project. And that's my last slide. Thank you very much. This was Ellie Reed. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right. So um, what Ellie spoke about really was the, the, the engine of country engagement under this new program, the CLP, the country-led planning process. And uh, what we hear about next is one of the modalities for, for, for capacity development. And of course, there's many different modalities, um, but there is one that has been particularly successful recently, and Rocio will speak to us about this. She will present the case of a, uh, of a, recent, of a recent learning experience on CEPAL, which I think provides an example of how the Aim for Forest program will reach out and aim to develop impact. Rocio, over to you, please. 
Uh, thank you, Teal. Thanks uh, to the organizers. Let me talk about the CPAL online facilitated course uh, foreseen under output one of the AIM for Forest project related to tools and platforms just presented by Marike. The Forest and Land Monitoring for Climate Action CPAL course was facilitated from 24 March till 7 May, simultaneously in English, Spanish, and French. It aimed to support knowledge and skill development for applying high-resolution satellite imagery for forest and land monitoring, and more specifically, it focused on how the CPL platform can support forest and land monitoring. The course is composed of five modules. Module one related to the institutionalization of forest data. Module two introduces CPL. And module three, four, and five are more specific on topics related to MRV, restoration, and peatland. The course was offered for free and open to all interest in digital platforms and tools for forest and land monitoring. Participants choose to either follow the entire course or a limited number of modules. Three learning paths were offered to them. Based on the learning path, and performance assessment, participants can either obtain a certificate of completion or a digital badge that certifies the competencies acquired. Let me share some statistics with you. After its launch, just two weeks after, the course was at its maximum capacity with more than 2,300 participants registered. The high demand for participation reflects the growing interest in forest and land monitoring using freely available high-resolution satellite imagery. Registered participants represented more than 150 countries from around the world with all regions well represented, making it truly a global initiative. The course was drawn, has drawn participants from universities research centers, governments, the private sector, non-governmental organizations, and civil society, with 34% of participants being women. The percentage of active participants as of today is 57% that log on the platform at least once. Let's give a look at the platform. As mentioned, it was produced in English, Spanish, and French. We have a right and a left-hand menu, and by scrolling down, you will find all five models. Let's access one of them, module one. You can find the learning objectives, a support area, and a group of learning activities. In the right-hand menu, you find a series of informative tabs which help participants throughout the course. At the end, participants took their graded test. You can move to the next module. And at the end, you can access the model that provides you the certificate of completion and your digital badge. The course promoted an interactive approach through self-paced lessons, case studies, videos, discussion forum, and online live facilitated sessions. This course was not just about learning new skills. It was also about creating a community of professionals passionate about forest and land monitoring for climate action. Participants had actually the chance to connect share ideas, and seek opportunities for networking and collaboration. Before closing, let me invite Brenda Anisia, remote sensing officer working at the National Forest Authority in Uganda to share with us her experience with the online course. Brenda, I have the following questions for you to share with the audience. How did you find the course and how is it relevant to your work? Thank you, Rocio. 
this course for me was very good, <clears throat> not for me alone, but uh, for my colleagues as well in Uganda. It was self-paced, like you could take it at your own time, you take it after work, and it had different materials, it had documents, PDF documents to follow, it had live webinars. Even though you missed the webinars, you could uh, find them on the platform and rewatch and you're able to follow. And also, during the webinars, you're not allowed to follow. Like, even if you're not following what Eric is doing, you can sit back, watch, and then you wait for your own time to practice. So for me, the course was very good, and for my day-to-day -day work, which, uh, which is about producing activity data for Red Plus, this course is very helpful. I can quickly generate information on forest change using the index change that I learned during this course, and also I'm able to give an input to our decision makers. For example, for projects dealing with restoration, I learned about the C plan, and so the input from my work can be good for decision making. Thank you very much, Brenda. And how do you think you will apply your, uh, what you learn in your professional area? Okay, I'm already applying it. It wasn't my first time, though, to the platform, but uh, of course, CEPAL has been changing every day almost. The first time I got introduced to the platform was 2018, but it is never the same. Like, if you last maybe used it in 2018, today you'll be so lost because it has changed. There are so many tools, so I think it is um, something very good for us to have such courses so, so that we also get to know the different tools in there to see which ones we can apply. And yes, applying it, I think I've already explained to you, I do my work, I think, from CEPAL. I stopped using the conventional like, softwares to do the processing because with CEPAL, I know that I don't have to worry about computing power, I don't have to worry about internet going off because I know I have a session running. Power blacking out is not a problem anymore. So thanks to the CEPAL team, back then, my colleagues say that, okay, those who worked there before me, that processes would take days. Like, you run a segmentation for the country, two weeks, three weeks. Because you had to download an image, you had to use your computer to do the processes and yet you don't have the best computing power. So I would also request that the course is made open, say those who didn't register for it can have a chance to register and be able to learn from it. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your feedback and if you all want to learn more on the integration of CEPAL into Uganda's forest, National Forest Monitoring System, uh, please check this case study or get in contact with Brenda. Let me close uh, by thanking the participants in this course, uh, the course team that is together with me today in, the front of, in front of me, the National Forest Monitoring Team. More than 25 experts have been involved from different thematic areas and the FAWI Learning Academy. If you are interested in taking the self-paced course or learning more about the CEPAL, Follow the discussion on our social media channels, Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, or visit our website or contact us via email. Soon, this course will be open to all and available in the FAWI Learning Academy. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was Rocio Condor with support from uh, Brenda Anisia. Thank you very much. This concludes the, uh, the, the presentations that we have and we can now discuss. So please think about the, uh, the questions that you'd like to make and the interesting remarks that you have on these presentations. We will admit both questions from the room, obviously, but then also online, and I can see that the first questions are already coming in. For those who are connected online, please, uh, please now is the moment to type in your question. Alessandro is sitting next to me. We'll be able to read them out to the room. I have the privilege to ask the first question, <laughs> but you please help me. I will, come, uh, I will start out with a question on the objective of the program, and uh, you know, then maybe there's other questions on the floor where you can contribute. 
but I think um, what I can see from the chat is that there's already interest in speaking a bit more about the engagement uh, of countries, of stakeholders in this program. So uh, that could be a second block of issues to discuss. But yes, let's speak about the objectives a bit further. I thought I'd turn to Fiona, who was our first person. I thought I'd turn to Fiona to, and, and ask her to, to speak a bit more about the objectives that the UK has here, because the UK doesn't only support this program, but there's a whole portfolio of, uh, of activities that the UK supports. Among them, for example, an engagement in the Carbon Fund, if I'm not mistaken. The UK is part of the LEAF program. There's a whole Red Plus strategy. I was going to invite Fiona to speak to us a little bit about how the engagement in the Aim for Forest program relates to the other pieces of engagement that the UK has in Red Plus. Sure. Thanks, Till. Um, yes, so I think our kind of existing um, support in international climate finance for Red Plus has been very much focused to date on um, incentivizing actions to reduce deforestation um, through uh, the provision of results-based finance. So a lot of our kind of focus and efforts and support has been on phase three of Red Plus. Um, and one intended additional output for that is to generate high quality credits that can be transacted through carbon market uh, mechanisms. Um, so through initiatives like the LEAF coalition. Um, but yeah, I think we're super mindful now that um, we kind of a, had a, a bit of a reassessment of the capacity gaps and the continued needs that countries continue to face in actually realizing Red Plus results-based payments. So, um, you know, Red Plus is hugely complex and it involves uh, a multitude of different organizations and entities and lots of different moving parts. Um, so our uh, previous kind of early expectations on timelines were definitely over ambitious and we're really mindful of the fact that you know the the support for building the enabling environment for red plus still remains um, so definitely this um, program is part of that emphasis on red plus readiness and phase one um, and has this kind of yeah dynamic in mind for not leaving countries behind um, really seeing where we can support um, countries to uh, in their readiness capabilities um, for kind of continued Red Plus implementation. Um, I think also a really strong alignment with this program is the country-driven approach. Um, we really want to be able to support countries to kind of give them the choices to the development of Red Plus programming and kind of consider which Red Plus standard might be appropriate for them, depending on their different contexts. You know, we have this really standard agnostic approach, um, and we want to be able to, you know, yeah, tailor um, to the specific um, interests and ambitions of different forest countries, um, and utilise the most appropriate high integrity um, standard. Um, so yeah, there's just kind of two big components of that. Um, and then, yeah, I think uh, another one is kind of the sustainability um, and transformational potential, um, which is a key driver for um, UK funding. Um, so this program and the country-led planning process and having um, this emphasis on kind of the exit strategy planning um, is really beneficial for us as well. Thanks. Thank you, Fiona. Um, please, please uh, raise your hand in case you have questions from the floor. I will have an immediate follow-up question. So Fiona spoke about high integrity and high quality credits. I think that's a question for Marike. What is a high quality credit? Unless there's someone else here in the room dying to answer that question. There's a comment there. Yeah, please add a comment. Why don't you? Please. Can you please say your name and who you work for? Yeah. Hi, my name is Yasmin Mendes de Moura. I'm from University of Helsinki. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, you have to speak louder and slower. Okay. Difficult. <laughs> so I just come across the same question about the high integrity. And I also would like to know how much uh, is the conversation going with other organizations such as the SBTI, the Science Based target initiative who also provide guidance then for the private sector in terms of high integrity MRV and the whole uh, credit of carbon system. So 
No. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank, Thank you, you for that. No, that's great. Let's, let's get Mariki to quickly explain what on earth a high quality credit is, and then Fiona can speak about the relationships to the SBTI. So there is not a really good answer to what is high integrity um, carbon credit because it hasn't really been defined. <laughs> it's been also defined differently in different places. But it's a term that's being used a lot by emerging carbon standards uh, and then especially the, the jurisdictional standards. Um, Maybe I can summarize what those standards intend, but don't take this as a solid answer because <laughs> there might be different answers to, to what that actually is. I think what, what, uh, what the term seeks to um, uh, indicate is that it is a credit that um, is, is somewhat reliable, robust, uh, credible, so it has to do with uh, many different aspects, uh, both about how the measurement is done, has good practice being used for uh, assessing, for measuring, for uh, the, the, the emissions, but at the same time, you know, what has, has good practice, uh, does it exist, being used for baseline setting, uh, and, and there, of course, uh, that's a bit of an open question, what is good practice there, but the standards uh, come up with specific requirements, especially on the, for example, the reference period to use. So, yeah, but there is not a overall agreed upon definition of high integrity. Anyone in the room disagreeing? I know you have a question, but anyone disagrees with what Marika just said? No one dares. Um, let's, let's, let's hear very quickly from Fiona whether she wants to comment on the SBTI and then we can ask, uh, Khalil, answer Khalil's question. Um, sure, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, and I think, yeah, so SBTI and, and kind of other um, mechanisms out there, like we think about ICVCM as well, and we've got the Article 6 methodologies um, coming up, and also kind of expectations set under Corsia. Um, there's all these different kind of mechanisms for kind of setting that um, expectation for what a high integrity um, standard or high integrity approach might look like. Um, and I think under this program, we really want to ensure that we're kind of reflecting those as well, helping countries to understand what that means, um, how we can harmonize that um, within kind of their own um, implementation of these systems as well. So yeah, very much um, on, on our radar. Thank you, Fiona. Khalil. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, if you could just say who you work for quickly for everyone. Sure. Yeah, uh, Khalil Walji, c 4 ecraft um, Yeah, I figured my question's uh, the right timing since we're um, discussing contentious or um, somewhat ambiguous terms. Um, I wanted to first say thank you very much to the panel. That was a very fascinating uh, panel discussion. Um, but I wanted to ask about this word that I've, I've seen uh, throughout the presentation, institutionalization, which I think um, can be interpreted quite broadly or, or, or very differently. I mean, personally, when I think about it, uh, you understand it to be this sort of embeddedness of a public institution, the utility of this, this institution, a normative st structure, uh, and often the only major factor that's considered is leadership by the government. But of course, institutionalization has a much broader uh, so, so, sort of social theory in many different aspects. So I, I did want to ask the, the team, and I'm not sure who I should direct the question to, um, but maybe you can just share where has institutionalization worked? Uh, I think that can help kind of populate our idea of, of, of what are the key factors uh, for where it works, but on the contrary, where hasn't it worked? Um, and, and I ask that because I, I also imagine that helped in, in the team's thinking of which 20 countries would be targeted for this program. Thanks. Thank you, Khalil. Institutional embedding. I'd really like to hear Ellie comment on this. Maybe she can speak a bit about how the CLP process can help countries work towards that goal. But yes, institutional embedding is part of the holy grail, really, of what we try to achieve when we engage with countries. And I think there was a second part to that question where you asked uh, how the 20 countries would be identified. We, we come to that later. But Eli, please, please try to answer some of, some of Khalil's questions. Oh, and maybe we can hear from Faith afterwards. Maybe she can speak a bit about institutional embedding of the forest monitoring system in Kenya. Maybe that would be useful. But Eli, over to you, please. Thanks, interesting question. And um, I would say there is, if, if we had the answer, then the CLP would have not been needed because we don't have the answer, but that's what we're trying to figure out. And from past experience, you know, it, go, it goes to really two basic things, how we do this in general from, we've done a lot of technical support. We're now trying to do a lot more into functional support and, and helping 
and a clearing what is actually needed, exactly what you ask. And what we've done so far is persistence and sustainability. So those two elements we will apply going forward. We will work with countries. Part of the COP process is exactly to let the countries identify their needs, not to push them and say, hey, here's what you need, here's what we're going to give you, and then deal with it. The question is not that. The idea is that out of this, as I mentioned, the circular process, that you have the assessment, the context, the cross-sectoral context assessment, which then leads to, to, to um, technical and functional gap assessments. And at this point, it's clear how this embedding can happen because with different countries that will be a different process. It will not be fit for all. The, exactly the beauty of the COP process is it will take the country to lead it. That means that it will be based on the specific context, the specific issues with each country. And if one country, and we'll hear after that about Kenya, if they're at a certain level of, of embedding the national forest monitoring system with their government system, and it's really at high level, okay, that, that fantastic, some other countries might not be. So in that respect, they'll need very little support from the COP, whereas others will need more. And the process will move at different pace and with different level of commitments to what the countries would want from us as a supporting factor here. So the answer, again, is not short, it's not easy, but the idea is that if it was easy, we would have done it by now. But the idea is that we will continue working directly with the countries, let them lead, and, and we'll be the supporting element here to what could be added to that and, and working always with this short-term, long-term even um, outlook and providing some exit strategy that it really becomes sustainable system within the, the government system of each country individually that participate in this process. And then you had a second follow-up question. So I hope that kind of answered your rather complex question. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ellie. Um, Faith, would you be able to say a few words about institutional context of the forest monitoring system in Kenya? Okay, thank you very much. Maybe this in context of the National Forest Monitoring System and institutional arrangements. Of course, it's usually a big challenge on where to house it and who manages it. However, we also look at the institutions and also their mandates, what they're expecting to do in the government. Let's say, for example, we'd of course definitely house it in the Ministry of Environment because that's where we have the environment, forestry, and climate change. However, within the Ministry of Environment, we have state departments of forestry and climate change. They have kind of overlapping roles. So who takes what role? So it's something that keep on evolving and changing and of course definitely under discussion each and every day. Uh, when it's so called maybe an activity in NFMS of forest inventory, we don't expect somebody from agriculture to do a forest inventory. This is housed in the Kenya Forest Service. But however, somebody in the, even in the university will say, we also deal with forestry. We would want to also want to be part of those institutions. It's complicated. However, the countries have to make decisions every time changing and see what country, I mean, what institution does what in what aspect and what particular activity. Yeah, maybe that's. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. One more question on institutionalization because it's something that we really have at heart. I was going to speak a bit more about capacity development modalities here. I was going to ask Rocio to say a few more words about, about what, the, what the merit really is on, um, on that modality that you presented. But then we also have Christina Petraka here who is the head of the capacity development and e-learning academy that we have here. And I'm just wondering whether she from her perspective can also say a few words about, about um, you know, the capacity development approaches that we have, including in the FAO eLearning Academy, and how those can contribute to, um, to capacity development, including with, uh, with regards to, to it working towards institutional uptake of forest monitoring systems. Rusi, is it better if you go first, or should we ask Christina first to say a few words? Uh, thank you, Teal. And I, I think uh, I will um, pass the word to Christina, but maybe just to to complement what I have presented before is the fact that uh, um, we have gained uh, some experience in the last years in delivering a global capacity development process through massive open online course, etc. So I, I do believe that this is probably not uh, the only way we can uh, support countries. And I'm sure uh, together with the FAO Learning Academy, we will be able to deliver uh, different type of approaches, and I, I will ask uh, Christina Pretaki to, to tell us a bit more about how the blended approaches uh, can be delivered uh, during Aim for Forest. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil and uh, Rocio, for this opportunity to provide a little bit more information about the FAO, uh, what the FAO eLearning Academy does. Um, the first thing is that what we've noticed in years is that the more you, di you diversify your delivery methods and your pedagogical models, and the higher is the impact that you have. So the idea is really, since each of us have different ways of learning and different preferences and schemas, mental schemas to learn, it's important to basically um, diversify the methods. And this is why we use different methodologies. So we use, for example, mobile learning for audiences that are in very remote areas. We use, uh, for example, MOOCs, which are massive open online courses. We use blended learning programs where we integrate wikis and blogs where people have to also contribute uh, to an entire project, maybe at national level. But we also organize, we also create um, masters and uh, postgraduate degrees with uh, universities worldwide. Uh, what we've noticed is what is fundamental for um, a learning program to be successful is to really focus on the target audiences, what, what are their roles, what are their job tasks, and from there design the, the entire program based on the skills and the competences that they have to acquire. So for us, the analysis of the target audience is fundamental to understand what is the change that we want to see. What are the competences that the, 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 these professionals need to acquire? And from there, we design the courses. The other, I think, um, successful uh, factor that was mentioned by uh, Rocio also is um, the certification. So what we are trying to do is to bridge the gap between formal and informal uh, education. So we are trying to allow people in, in the countries from wherever they are to acquire the competences they need for sustainability. So to be able uh, in a flexible manner, in a quick manner, uh, acquire the competences that they need and we certify these competences uh, because the, the courses are competency-based and we also um, assess their performance and the acquisition of the competences. And when so, sorry, once just so that we have more time for other questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once they have, uh, once they uh, succeed, then they get a, a certificate of competences. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. <laughs> I, I was you. concluding anyway. <laughs> no, that's Thanks. good. That's good. No, look, I, I, because there's there's some very interesting questions in the chat that I want to get to, but I also want to quickly ask Evan to say something. who has been with his hand up. Evan, if you would also say for everyone who you work for, please. Yeah, hi, Evan Notman, uh, work with uh, USAID, and I'm the US uh, lead for uh, GFOI. I want to start by just saying oh, how pleased I am to, to hear the announcement of this. Um, I think it's uh, fantastic to see additional resources and efforts coming into the, the, the broader GFOI uh, uh, effort that we that we have so I I'm just want to say thank you for for that and and also highlight I think what has been really a, a, a collaborative and um, really well thought out process in terms of understanding uh, how a, a process can work with the broader GFOI community uh, to, to do work and I think one of those is, is really centered around the idea of the country led uh, planning process, and I think this is something that GFOI has been discussing for quite a while, coming out of really some of uh, the capacity building workshops and recognizing some of the challenges, and, and those include the challenges of, of some of the uh, institutional arrangements and coordination, as well as comments that we heard uh, repeatedly that uh, sometimes in our efforts to provide capacity building, we're, we're causing problems and that we need to be uh, able to coordinate better and that the countries need to be able to have more uh, ability to, to communicate clearly what are their needs and, and, and how in a, in a way that is reaching across the GFOI community so that they're getting support that they need in a less confusing way. Um, and then also the idea of, you know, how do you effectively communicate what you're doing that's important for assessment, it's important for countries to kind of on that transparency side. Um, so with all that in mind, I also kind of wanted to uh, ask you a little bit, I, I think, you know, we all recognize that each country is going to be uh, unique and, and want to engage in the process in a different way. And, and I'm interested in thinking about how do you see the process working so that uh, 
we all within the GFOI community can uh, participate and, uh, uh, as you've highlighted, I, uh, have opportunities to uh, support countries in the way that they, they feel are, is most useful. Thank you, Evan. Had I known you would say these things, maybe we could have uh, gotten you for the closing remarks then. <laughs> well, that's excellent. Look, I, I will ask Julian to, to respond to this, but I'll also ask him to respond to uh, the, the, the golden question, which has just come in in the chat. And I'm going to ask Alessandro to read it out for everyone, please, from Zambia. Yes, this is a question from uh, Brian Mutasha from the Forestry Department of Zambia. He would like to find out the criteria for countries to participate in the Aim for Forest program. So yes, uh, Julian, can you answer both of these questions? How are we going to engage with the GFOI community and how will country selection be undertaken? Yeah, I think uh, building on Evan's very nice intervention, I think we've designed the CLP as a GFOI activity. So I see it as something the whole community hopefully can um, can get behind. And I, I think uh, relating to a specific question from a country for support, I mean, I, I hope, and, and we've seen some of the, the approaches we can use to reach, reach huge audiences in these days. We've adapted <laughs> due to something that was forced on us. But um, I really hope through the CLP we can, we can include uh, many countries. We can be really inclusive with a view that different support providers can then come in and support countries. As, as a core GFOI uh, collaborative exercise. And one thing I did, I did notice was missing from your slide, Ali, was, I mean, you, something like a UN rate technical assistance I see as another major delivery path for countries. Um, as, we, as we unroll the CLP, we'll identify a lot of needs and then the big capacity development partners, the, the silver carbons, the UN rate technical assistance, can then uh, deliver support in a really coordinated way. Um, with support from the GFOI office. So for me, it's a, um, I, I see it as being really inclusive and, and I, I encourage everybody to, to, um, to join us. And uh, we have some beautiful flyers and uh, QR cards on the, on the front table. So any interested countries, please, um, our doors are open. And, uh, and maybe, maybe I, um, I would like to call on even Tom because I see this as something, as a bit of a game changer for the whole community, you know? As, as Evan said, really aligning all our support in a, in a structured way. Do you want me to respond to that quickly, Till? Thanks. I mean, I you just, really should. <laughs> excellent. Thanks. I mean, I, I agree completely. The whole, I guess, concept of the CLP is that there is a, a process really for, for countries themselves to be able to, it's called country-led planning, <laughs> a process for countries to be able to um, pick up and run with for them to consider how to embed these systems within their own unique national institutions in a system that they know and understand. The institutional arrangements and the biophysical conditions will vary from country to country. We do want a, I guess, a globally generic um, framework that, that countries can then take and, and adapt to their own unique circumstances. And the great thing about this community is if, you know, having the CLP as a GFY process is if the international partners can agree on that and that's something they understand, the countries can then take that and adapt it to their own needs. And then the plans and the outcomes that come from that will be something that multiple development partners can see and we hope respond to. Um, and that will be a really key, I guess, building block for further strengthening global coordination. So very much thanks to the UK for, for including this. Um, there's a bit of work still to do on scoping the CLP and we hope that many other partners can continue to get involved. So it is something you know and understand and something you can continue to use over time. Um, and that when countries um, start to participate in as well, it is something they can, they can adapt to their own unique circumstances. But yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. Look, time is up. I know there's, 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 there's further remarks, but time is up, unfortunately. Um, come to the reception. Let's continue speaking at the reception about all this. For those who are connected online where we haven't been able to answer all of the questions, Alessandro will post his email in the chat, and then you can send him a message, and then I promise we will respond. But for us who are here, um, thank you so much for participating. We will have closing remarks still. Um, Julian, will you deliver those, or is that something that Fiona will do? Well, I'll be very brief. Again, just inviting you to join us and participate. Or I, I think this is a really exciting moment for the whole community. And uh, we, can, we can coordinate, we can collaborate, and uh, yes, and look forward to discussing um, 
after this, and please, I'll pass to Fiona, who's actually was instrumental in uh, designing and, and launching the entire program. So huge thanks to Fiona. Thanks, Julian. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't have much to add, actually. Um, and yeah, I think just the emphasis again on collaboration um, and hopefully can speak to a few of you during this week. Um, and yeah, thanks to FAO and GFOI and, and others for contributing to the development of this program as well. All right. Thank you so much. Be reminded also there is an FAO booth tomorrow. There is an opportunity to discuss more. Thank Thanks you very much. This was, a, this was the Info Forest event. <laughs>